Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with having reached us, and uh, I'd like to say a few words about the philosophy of uh, the Russian soul. and. Uh, the uh, future accession of Malaysia to uh, BRICS. Uh, what are the benefits of joining BRICS for Malaysia? A globalized world. We believe in uh, continuing our trade relationship with all. We have uh, traditionally, cumulatively, very strong investments in trade with the United States and Europe. We are building a greater collaboration with China, who has become a stronger bond together, and China remains one of our major and key partners. Russia has been traditionally a good uh, uh, country that we work well diplomatically. But as I said to President Putin last night, there is vast opportunities. Russia has seen its resilience, its capacity to expand in all sectors. Now, being in BRICS would allow us to benefit and share. Malaysia now is this hub for semiconductor in the region. Um, there are some fields that we can share, but there are a lot of other areas we can. But I think the Global South Network of BRICS would give us an opportunity to leverage, to ensure that there is a fair trade practices, that the financial, international financial infrastructure is not monopolized by one country or one region. And then essentially it will be beneficial not only to Malaysia, but I think to the global south and naturally to the whole world. Thank you. Vladimir Vladimirovich, when you were talking about the uh, BRICS summit, uh, what are you awaiting from the BRICS summit in Kazan? And uh, in accordance with the results of 2023, $294 million is the trade turnover, a billion dollars is the trade turnover of BRICS. Uh, what, uh, how do you assess uh, the uh, possible future developments and de-dollarization? Is this uh, a sign of the present? Well, above all, uh, we are not conducting the policy of de-dollarization. We continue to uh, conduct settlements in dollars. We were kicked out from uh, dollar settlements. Um, but this is not the main point. The main point is that uh, the currency of any particular country reflects the economic power of the country. And the bigger the economy, the more partners it has, the more popular is the currency for trade settlements. Oh, it's natural that when you have a lot of partners, economic partners, you use different types of currencies in settlements. So using currencies for uh, settlements uh, depends on the development of the uh, economy. After the Second World War, the United States used the opportunity of the results of the Second World War in the world economy, uh, conducting the Marshall Plan, creating one uh, a global Bretton Woods system, which uh, had uh, been uh, reconstructed uh, and have created a single world currency, the dollar. And it all dependent, dependent and continues to depend on the power, uh, on the capacity of uh, economic growth and the economy of the country. And Prime Minister uh, of Malaysia has just mentioned that um, trends, there is a shift of uh, development of the economy on a global scale. Uh, global South accounts for more than 50 percent of GDP world GDP. Well, the BRICS countries uh, occupy one-third in the global economy. 
and account for one third of the global economy. So naturally, uh, as far as the usage of different currencies is concerned, I'd like to say that with our partners in BRICS, uh, the usage of national currency accounts for more than 65 percent of trade operations, which is quite naturally, well, uh, the political forces of the United States have been deploying um, non-professional methods and, in a way, moving us toward that decision. They probably understand the mistakes they have made, but it's far too late for them to turn back. They think and they see that something should be corrected, should be altered, because the instruments they've been using are not working. We are uh, using uh, natural, uh, our national currencies in uh, trade operations, but it's difficult to change the situation now. Uh, because in changing anything, uh, they would have to accept making mistakes. So they've been uh, calculating in such a way that we would be destructed, which hadn't happened, but the tendencies uh, are obvious. And the tendencies of development on the global scale are actually moving us towards using national currencies in settlements today. As of today, Chinese economy uh, on uh, tra uh, on um, the parity of uh, buying capacity is more than half of the world buying capacity. So the volume of uh, buying capacity and the parity of uh, buying capacity is larger. The U.S. occupies the second place uh, in uh, the world, but China is growing and, you, and uh, the Chinese currency is used for uh, trade and by trade partners in settlements. And currently, it's, uh, Russia is uh, in, in uh, the third place. We have taken over uh, Germany in this case, and we have taken over Japan. It's true that Japan and Germany have uh, a lot of beneficial uh, trends of development as they are operating in high-tech uh, spheres, but the volumes in our country are higher because we have more opportunity to invest into prospective areas of development. And this is not connected only with political conjuncture. Um, you see, the uh, Europeans and the Americans have made such steps that are moving uh, forward the development of national currencies. As for the development of ties between uh, BRICS uh, countries, they are growing. They are strengthening. In uh, t uh, 2005, we uh, formed a BRICS uh, Russia and China were then joined by Brazil. Now we have expanded the number of members. More than 30 countries, more than 30 countries of the world are ready to cooperate and work within uh, the uh, BRICS, uh, and some of them are ready to join uh, BRICS. Uh, we, the countries, boast of. Uh, uh, highly developed economies uh, with um, uh, rich uh, culture, and they will uh, improve the development of this organization. Thank you. Mr. Anbar Ibrahim, we have uh, discussed it now with uh, President Putin that uh, Russia has been trying to find a peaceful solution. And why do you think uh, the negotiations in Istanbul were a failure and the negotiations failed? I happened to be on a visit to Istanbul, and the President Tayyip Erdogan asked me to extend for a day because he was busy uh, monitoring the development of the progress of the negotiations. And naturally, I knew and I thought at that time that the uh, issue will be over because apparently the, both parties have agreed the principles and the parameters. So I think. Um, I am, of course, of the view that you must secure peace. 
and it will help immensely not only to these two countries but the entire world because it is disrupting the global chain supplies and etc. But you must start from somewhere and as I understand the parameters laid down in Istanbul was probably the basis for that understanding as you work from there. And, and um, I think both sides have agreed and, and I think President Putin is right. You, uh, we support the initiative but we must begin somewhere with the parameters that is fair and just. And, um, and one cannot uh, renege on the commitment on these issues. And I think most countries should then implore that uh, some basis, particularly that was agreed upon, must be honoured so that we can secure peace as soon as possible. Да, Спасибо. Да, Александр, извините. Да, вы сказали о том, что нам не удалось. You have uh, mentioned that uh, we have uh, not uh, agreed with uh, the midi, uh, midi, with the help of uh, President Erdogan, but we did manage to come to terms uh, to agree, and uh, the document has been endorsed uh, by the Ukraine. It means uh, that uh, on the whole, these uh, agreements and the terms and conditions of the contract uh, satisfy the Ukraine, and the only reason uh, it was not implemented because they will they have been instructed and lectured not uh, to live by the contract and uh, the ambition of the west uh, was uh, to reach a strategic uh, loss a strategic strategic defeat for uh, russia to break it into pieces and uh, they uh, believe that uh, here is the manner from the heaven and they will be managed to they will manage to achieve the strategic goals that they have been striving to achieve for centuries Boris Johnson has came and he said, no, keep fighting, and that's why they're, they're still fighting. I was under the impression that those that uh, are the leaders of the Ukraine are aliens or foreigners, foreigners for their own countries. They do not think about the destiny of their own country because uh, such heavy losses, I don't know what they will be doing in the future. It is uh, necessary now for them uh, to bring down the age bracket uh, for the to drafting people and uh, doing what they did in the Nazi Germany Hitler Jugend, uh, but uh, that will not help. The next step will be to draft uh, students and it will bleed the country and uh, I'm just under the impression that uh, it's not their peoples, uh, but uh, the relatives of uh, the leading elite uh, live abroad, they hop uh, abroad and uh, that's it. So uh, they uh, just uh, covered and uh, they proclaim the nationalistic uh, slogans and uh, fooling their uh, populations. But uh, once again, I would like to state that uh, if there is uh, a desire of the Ukraine uh, to carry on with the negotiations. I can do that, but based on the agreements that were achieved in Istanbul. And uh, another subject matter, there is uh, such a notion as Malaysian economic uh, miracle, thanks to the economic zones that you have set up. What are the conditions uh, for business and uh, are Russian companies welcome there? Yes. Um, yesterday and even this morning, uh, we as a policy do not uh, regard, as uh, Vice President of China mentioned, we do not accept unilateral sanctions, but we are of course uh, trying to resolve that so that we are not seen to be uh, confronting any uh, power or economic power in particular. So we focus on uh, economic zones in the country and uh, the Russian companies, I've told them, we are an independent country, the centrality, uh, we want to be uh, engaging with Russia more uh, effectively uh, and um, I was uh, extremely delighted that many of them are coming. When I asked them, when are you coming, this is we're planning, some are saying, we will go next week and a group will come in October. So uh, there is interesting progress in, in uh, interest 
because um, of course we are fortunate because of the situation and our relations uh, more so with, with uh, China these days that we have for example growth registered uh, in the last quarter 5.9 percent with inflation at 2 percent with uh, huge investments uh, also from the United States particularly in the digital and energy uh, sector and Germany in particular so I think uh, we will do whatever is necessary. Um, you know, we can learn from the comprehensive plan package that President Putin mentioned. Um, and and um, there is enormous potential. I mean, the Russians should not in any way feel that uh, we are influenced by others or prejudice against others. There is this potential and this special relationship that Malaysia want to offer to Russia as a friend of ours. Спасибо. Prime Minister Ibrahim, uh, two secrets have been revealed. We've got to uh, learn the third secret from you. Is Malaysian business interested in coming to the advanced development territories and the free port of Vladivostok to work in a full-fledged manner here? The region was something new to us. This is my first visit, and uh, a number of uh, discussions have taken place. But Russia as a whole, of course, has been given enough attention. There's been growing trade and investments jointly in, of course, energy sector, industrial complex, and also in the digital technology. We're sending more students to Russia. And um, they, of course, this can be explored specifically. We're not as powerful as China. We're trying to be. We'll take time. Thank you. Спасибо. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Ibrahim, uh, last year your uh, country uh, registered a record number of Russian tourists, 110,000 people. It's a growth of 37 percent year on year, and this is not the limit yet. Uh, to boost these numbers, do you have plans for direct flights? Uh, we, we should not preclude the uh, aeroflot going to Malaysia. Uh, firstly, we have been um, seen and more attractive to Russian uh, tourists. You know, there's a huge increase in a year, and um, I think uh, the issue of uh, flight is one consideration. We say to have a green in principle. We are working on it as fast as possible, and then, of course, to introduce uh, Malaysia to um, Russian uh, public, and I think um, they would once they get to know. The country is uh, peaceful, is uh, economically vibrant, and it's a very beautiful country. I, mean, I don't want to compete with uh, Russia or China, but uh, at least what we have in Malaysia, you don't have in Russia. But what you have in Russia, we don't have in Malaysia. So it is important for both countries so that to increase the passage of uh, tourists, because they will see things that they have not seen in their countries. And I, I really hope that there is that potential uh, for Russians to come. And we do encourage. I mean, Malaysia is a friendly nation. No prejudice. We are not dictated by any power. And uh, we want to have that sort of uh, special relations uh, with Russia as we have with many countries. I think once you go there, you will find out that Malaysia is truly Asia. Uh, Prime Minister Ibrahim, and well, what about uh, Russia? Oh, the Russian tourists coming to Malaysia, uh, what should they see in Malaysia? What is the essence of Asia? The multiracial society, we have a strong ethnic um, indigenous and also Malay population. We have um, a large number of um, uh, Chinese ethnic minorities and Indians and uh, indigenous tribes. We have uh, a range of um, um, what do you call uh, virgin jungles. Uh, you have beautiful beaches uh, and um, it's equatorial climate. It's, uh, we don't have winter so you can have uh, your swim throughout the year. And that's, of course, to my mind, an advantage. Um, I always have difficulty in travel because you, you always ask the question, is it going to be winter, is it going to be summer, is it hot, is it winter? So you have to change dress. Uh, in Malaysia, you can come comfortably. 
as long as you wear something, and you are fine. В зале стало, кстати, больше улыбающихся лиц на этой фразе, что всегда в молодости. Well, everyone is smiling when you said that it's warm and nice in Malaysia. Well, I've been to Malaysia, and I can confirm everything Prime Minister has just said. To the topic of our, um, uh, our session, Mr. Prime Minister, you already had a meeting with uh, Mr. President. Uh, there are prospects, and we need to develop our uh, cooperation. We have agreement about free trade between EAEU with uh, Iran, Iraq, and Serbia. And uh, the same agreement will be signed with Mongolia. There, is, uh, also there are also negotiations with Indonesia and some other countries. Are there any I such ideas in Malaysia? free trade and uh, there's no restrictions and I've assured uh, President Putin last night that whatever avenues are being uh, introduced will continue. I mean, um, we still have good relationships with Iran um, in most of these countries. And, and uh, if the parameters are right, encouraging free trade, in, we will uh, pursue. There is um, no issue at all to my mind. Even now, without the special arrangement, you can see this uh, new wave of interest from both sides in Malaysia and uh, Russia. Now, with the agreement, it will, of course, further facilitate and uh, assist um, the, the business community. In fact, we are, we are inviting uh, delegations representing banks, aerospace and industry, and, and uh, some others uh, to come. And uh, we will, what is important is that my assurance that you will see uh, a faster change, uh, a more positive change in terms of uh, the trade uh, and, and also exchanges between Malaysia and Russia. And we are determined to do record that uh, as soon as possible. Let's continue this conversation about energy. Mr. Ibrahim, Malaysia is the second largest producer of oil and gas in southeastern Asia. And by the way, the renowned Petronas Towers in the capital are named after the largest energy company in your country. What is your current assessment of the situation in the oil and gas market in the world in general and whether Malaysia is considering any joint project with Russia in energy sector? We are discussing the issue of energy transition where I think um, uh, Russia has an upper hand. We're discussing that. We are, of course, still continuing exploration because um, the deadline is, of course, uh, to ease uh, the dependence on traditional uh, dependence on oil uh, or coal. But still, for now, it is important. I mean, we cannot deny, deny the fact that uh, the import of coal from Russia comes about over $600 million. So temporarily, this um, uh, energy uh, is still required until we are able to transition into uh, green uh, energy. But for now, the focus is there. We still remain to be an important player, and uh, we will therefore have some sort of a synergy and working relations uh, to ensure that the transition into uh, hydrogen green technology would uh, be of immense benefit in our attempt to, um, to, to progress as, a, as a, a country that's not totally dependent on fuel. Next topic. Mr. Ibrahim, I'd like to address you. We can't forget about the conflict in the Middle East. Please share with us your vision. What is the exit from the current situation? As I've consistently said, um, we cannot use the narrative of many uh, in the media or Western capitals, that uh, it all began with the 7th of October, Hamas attack. It all began with colonization. It all began with the Nakba in 1948. It all began because of the reluctance to accept the resolution of the United Nations consistently and uh, of uh, continued harassment of settlers uh, in, in the West Bank. So I think uh, we need to put the narrative right. Uh, do we want a solution? Yes. And I, I commend, of course, uh, the Russian position, the Chinese position, Foreign Minister Wang Yi have taken initiative, um, and, and many countries. And, and um, I think the majority of countries have taken a position, including recognition of the state of Palestine. But why is it not happening? Because of the 
intransigence of Israel and unfortunately with the total support of uh, the United States. In fact, giving him a standing ovation when atrocities have been committed. Uh, I, I, that's why I ask um, my colleagues, even in the West, where's the humanity? Where, why do you talk about justice? Why do you go and preach to us about human rights and democracy? Uh, why is there contradiction uh, when it comes to treatment of issues uh, happening in the world? And again, yeah. and uh, what we what we need in this world now is a consistent, coherent message. Yes, we respect freedom. Yes, we respect the dignity of man or woman. Yes, we must oppose all forms of colonization. Because what is the issue in P P Palestine now, not only in Gaza, but all in Palestine, is the issue of dispossession. You conquer, you, you take people's land, you dispossess, you kill them, you detain them, you take over their houses, you, you, you treat them as an uh, open-air prison, and this is known. That is why I know we, are, we come from a small country. We know our limits. That's why we thank our dear friends here for their uh, support. But it is, it is creating so much a problem, not only the Muslim world, but those who believe in freedom and justice. It is creating problems for us because people are saying, why are you not doing anything more when people are being killed daily? And that is my point. So I just hope and pray that there is a, finally sanity will prevail to those who have influence in the world because they are finally accountable. No country, no person can continue to do this gross injustice and tolerate the atrocities and think they are safe. I don't believe that can ever be accepted. We want justice to all mankind. And of course, we cannot deny justice because they have their different color or different religion or different creed. Justice means justice for humanity. And it's time that Palestine and Palestinians are treated as human beings, not as slaves or second class people. Thank you. President Putin, as a follow-up to the issue of the conflict in the Middle East, Moscow has repeatedly conveyed its position to both parties. Do they hear us, both sides of the Palestinian conflict, of uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I mean? Well, I could repeat everything that our dear guest has just been saying. The position of Russia is not conditioned by the particular situation or particular precedent. Our position has always been based on the positions taken earlier, and those decisions should be at the heart of resolution of any conflict. Uh, here we're talking about establishment of two independent states, and this position is shared by many people in the world, uh, including, as strangely as it may sound, by many people in the United States. But unfortunately, this conflict has not been resolved, and this particular issue is exactly the reason for the current uh, acute conflict. On our side, and by the way, the today's problem is largely related to the attempts of the United States of America to have a monopoly of settlement of this conflict, because the United States is not perceived as a country with neutral position regarding this conflict, and this is exactly the problem. But I'd like to reiterate that we are going to do everything in our power. And I was saying that earlier at the meeting with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, he's been to Moscow lately. We are going to do everything possible to make our contribution to settlement and resolution of this uh, long overdue conflict. Thank you very much. Let's move to the next topic. And sorry, uh, as for humanitarian matters, We are doing our best to address the matters um, related to the hostages that were taken. And I have to say that in this regard, we are achieving certain results. And we are very happy about it. And we'll keep intensifying our efforts and doing that in the future. Thank you. 
One more topic. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim, uh, in your introduction, you pointed out that, that Malaysia is the um, chair uh, of the ASEAN uh, for the future. What will the priorities in working be, and what will you be, uh, how will you be coordinating your efforts as far as Russia is concerned? region is the most peaceful in the world right now and economically v v most vibrant. Uh, the secret is, of course, is in centrality is um, independent uh, foreign policy position. We refuse to be dictated by any powers and we maintain excellent relations with our neighbors. Um, with Thailand, we are having special economic zone to promote and uh, ensure there is uh, more economic activity in the poorer sectors in north of uh, Malaya and South Thailand. With Singapore, we have a special economic zone in um, Johor, uh, which would uh, encourage more business and investments. And um, with Indonesia, we have excellent relations. I was just in Brunei. And even on issues that is considered to be quite uh, contentious, we, our decision is to continue with uh, bilateral mechanisms, multilateral mechanisms. The only issue that we have to confront is Myanmar. It's not spreading in terms of uh, its military activities, but it's causing some problems. Because, for example, Malaysia has to contend with 200,000 refugees from Myanmar and uh, and I said my my position as ASEAN chair is of course to try and resolve we don't want to dictate you see, the problem the failure sometimes in dealing with Myanmar it's a military junta you want to ensure democratic transition you have I think what is important for Myanmar is peace get all the parties to speak and talk to each other and maintain peace. Then they decide for themselves what form of government they want to, to, to have and do not dictate. And our problem with Myanmar in the past in the, is to have, uh, to, to try and dictate to them what sort of uh, government they should uh, have. So in our five-point consensus, we think that just respect these uh, fundamental rules we would, we would move. But on a different note, different level, uh, although we do have, uh, you know, growing issues about, uh, uh, particularly with the Philippines and China, our position is always to encourage the Philippines to continue to engage actively and try to resolve in the true spirit of ASEAN. And if we need to assist, we will continue to engage with our friends because we always uh, feel that there is a way uh, for the future. Uh, you know, um, and, and uh, I think more so, uh, taking that position of centrality, we do not want this region to be, again, a contentious region for the superpowers. If we have the, a problem in the region, we resolve it in the region. And uh, we do not uh, support any uh, um, intrusion of other powers into um, the region. We have problems, we try and resolve. And that's why I think my presence here in Vladivostok is to convey that message. That I think, um, contrary to some of the perceptions, we feel that our um, task is to ensure that we serve our people, that economically it has to be vibrant. And, and we want to show the, a, a new tradition of um, and diplomacy that engage with most countries and Russia included. Some countries in the West may have a problem with Russia, they will deal with it. As far as we are concerned, we do not have a problem. Uh, we have some issues we want to discuss, we bring it up, you see. Uh, so I think it, uh, we will start that tradition. So in ASEAN cohesion, we want to maintain that sort of relations we may choose to disagree. I mean, I have very good relations with Premier Li Chiang. Excellent. Um, it does not mean that we can agree on every issue, but we disagree as close friends. Um, they talk about the uh, issue of the more contentious issue with the South China Sea, and they keep on harping. You have a problem with China because of the border. You have a 
we have a problem with every single country in ASEAN. I mean, those uh, bordering Malaysia, because Malaysia is central. We have a slight pro border problem with Thailand, with Indonesia, uh, Indonesia, with Singapore, with Brunei, with the Philippines. Is that a problem? No, it's not a problem. These are issues that we discuss. It does not in any way uh, seem to be antagonistic. Why is it when it comes to China, you expect us to go and quarrel with them? I think we will continue to negotiate. Yes, we agree, and some issues we disagree. But in my experience now, I've taken over almost two years now as Prime Minister, I don't have a problem with China. So why must countries outside our turf insist that you have a problem? I don't. Now, you have a problem, you deal with it. So I think that should be the ASEAN uh, position and, and uh, to focus on the fundamentals. Yes, on economy, yes, on technology, yes, on AI, and energy, and tourism. And I think it will be a great uh, example of a sub-region that is peaceful and economically vibrant. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question I would like to address to all the participants uh, of the discussion. What are the main challenges that our countries are facing today? And what are the potential response that countries may have? Shall we begin with Mr. Ibrahim, please? And the most senior in office is President Putin, out of respect. Well, thank you. Well, the question is about the future, right? As to Russia, we have to provide for the development of the economy on uh, the domestic technological foundation and basis with highly qualified uh, and motivated, uh, uh, pot potentially motivated workers in the country. As uh, to the development of the global south, we have to provide the world or global leadership in the economy in the development of the economy, especially as far as the rates of uh, growth are uh, concerned. So the rate of gro growth in our country, this is what we are aiming at and this is what we are going to achieve. The same question goes to you. Was, uh, the economy. But how we view the economy is not unbridled capitalism of the past. It has to be a more humanistic approach towards development. Which means, of course, economic growth, more investments, more trade, but at the same time, more compassionate, more care towards the welfare of people. Poverty, I think the Vice President has mentioned. Housing, the President uh, Putin has mentioned. I think these are issues that have been largely ignored. So the experience in some countries in the West with phenomenal growth, but abject poverty and poor housing conditions, low quality education is not our option. So which means having a, a growth that is uh, uh, sustainable means that protecting the environment, having uh, good housing, quality education, and also anticipating fast enough the chain, the pace of change in a post-normal times that is uh, a new direction in terms of training of our young um, in digitalization, in, in, in uh, AI, with values which is in deficit in the world today. I strongly believe that we want to progress as a country, as a nation, we cannot ignore humanity, values, and ethics. It is a deficit in this world. That is why you see so many calamities, gross injustice, and um, racism, uh, even fanaticism, 
uh, atrocities committed in the name of religion because we do progress what dehumanize ourselves. That is why I started by referring to a lot of uh, great literary works of Russian um, figures because they always emphasize issues of ethics, moral and humanitarian ideals. Now, with that, I think um, we should learn from one another and um, we should not learn the excesses of the past, particularly when it comes to gross injustice and continuing to grow but marginalize the society. Thank you. Спасибо. Господин Джен, вам тот же самый вопрос, как и главный вызов. Мистер Джен, what are the challenges that our countries are facing now, nowadays? I'd like to say that um, the president of the country, Xi Jinping, uh, pointed out that uh, the uh, society uh, of common future for humanity is one of the most important uh, challenges for uh, the countries of the world, for the global population. We're all uh, on different stages of uh, development and have uh, different uh, issues of contention, but we need to build a society for common future. Thank you. Well, as far as I understand that we are rounding up our discussion, I would like to ex extend my gratitude to the guests of this discussion for the participation in this discussion and the attention to what is happening both in Russia and in the Far East. And I would like to address the auditorium. There are people here who work in the sphere of uh, the economy or representatives of uh, state uh, enterprises. I'd like to say that I'm quite sure that entrepreneurship is uh, above all creation of uh, wealth and prosperity. Uh, and if we address it that way, we will be able to achieve all the uh, tasks that we are setting before us. I'd like to thank you for participating in uh, these activities and events, and I hope that we realize our plans in the future. Thank you. And uh, on my side, I would like to quote you this time. Uh, uh, so the priority for the 21st century is the Far East. Yes, th I'd like to thank our moderator. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful job you did. Thank you.